Welcome to our weekly panel here at the Iowa City Public Library, where we have the good luck to bring together the distinguished writers of the International Writing Program to address issues pertinent to their work and to the society at large. First, my thanks to Susan Craig and the librarians here at the library who make this space available to us, and then to Downing Thomas and his staff at the International Programs at the University of Iowa, which furnishes the pizza in the back of the room. Uh, for more information about the writers, their bibliographies, their work, oh, and please silence your cell phones, including those on the, uh, <laughs> the panel. Uh, for more information about the IWP, the calendar of events, the writers' bios and samples of the work, please visit our website at iwp.uiowa.edu. The late great novelist John Gardner, a graduate of the Writers' Workshop, famously said that one of the ways in which uh, literature progresses is through the promotion of a trash form, by which I think he meant genre fiction, into a more elevated form of literary discourse. And we have examples of this throughout our literature here and abroad. I'm thinking particularly of the great espionage writer, John Le Carré, who transcended the idea of a genre and wrote works of enduring significance. The title of this panel, The Shape of Your Paragraph, also brings to mind a panel discussion that I was thrown onto many years ago at a writer's conference about two minutes before it was to begin, two writers, uh, myself and another writer, were added to a panel called The Shape of a Writer's Life. And I said to the director of the conference, what does that mean? And he said, don't worry. These other two writers know what it's about. <laughs> so I got on the panel. My friend was at one end. I was at the other end. We turned to the two writers between us. The first one turned to the second and said, do you want to start? And the second one said, no, why don't we start with Chris? <laughs> So I said, the shape of a writer's life, maybe it's a rhomboid. Flipped it to my friend who said, I think it's a triangle. And then the two writers in the middle had very well-crafted presentations. And through the uh, duration of their presentations, my friend and I felt like complete idiots. I know that's not going to be the case here today because we have well-crafted presentations by our illustrious writers who are in order. Tetyana Trutskaya, who comes to us from Ukraine. She graduated from the Skodovoroda National Pedagogical University in Kharkiv and now teaches English philology there. Her last novel, I'm never going to be able to pronounce it. How do you pronounce it? I knew that was exactly it. <laughs> Won the 2012 Olesh Honcher First Prize. Uh, sitting next to Tatyana is Shabod Sharkar, who comes to us from India, from Calcutta. He's published 29 books of poems, and he's, he's got many honors, and he's a former editor of Indian literature and the president of the Kobita Poetry Academy in West Bengal. He's working at now on a autobiography and poetry, and he's teaching here at the university as part of his Nehru Fulbright Fellowship. Seated next to him is Galit Dahan Karlabach, who comes to us from Israel. She's a writer, an essayist, and a teacher of creative writing. Her many books include the young adult series, uh, Arpaleya, and two novels, The Locked Garden and On the Edge, which won the Prime Minister's Prize for Hebrew Writers. She's also been awarded the National Library's Partis Scholarship and the Akum Prize. Seated next to uh, Galit is uh, Henry Lakava, Tavi from Finland, who teaches creative writing, writes children's fiction, translates poetry and academic work into Finnish. She is a founding member of Poesia, a poetry publishing cooperative, and the author of an experimental poetry book project. And bringing up the rear from Indonesia is Yusi Avianto Perianam, who is the founder of the publishing house Penerabit Banana, has a novel and several collections of short stories, among them Rumakopi, Singa Tertawa, The yes. Coffee House of the Laughing Lion. He's also been involved in theatrical productions, films, and other multimedia art ventures. You have on your, sh your uh, seats uh, index cards and pencils. I ask you to write the questions. We'll collect them at the end and then begin the conversation. But first, the presentation, starting with Tatiana. Thank you. Um, 
context. Lab UA, Terra Incognita. A decade before the beginning of a new con of a new century, the last generation of the broken empire would have called pure Ukrainian texts as literature of non-existence. Told in a variety of forms, the Ukrainian story reflecting the past, the past sounded alien to the hungry reader in the chaos of independence. The old Ukrainian male texts were predominantly about characters with a mixture of depression, despair, and bad luck with the usual choice of someone to blame, a feature of post-colonial literature. Those to blame were men from Moscow or Poland or simply landlords. While male writers continued to suffer from melancholy and depression, the playful nature of Ukrainian women generated texts of a new age. The natural national habit of laughing at everything and violating the rules were reflected in the freedom of crossing the borders of Jan and Topic and the desire to flirt with the audience. The first work of this kind was a scandalous novel written in 1996 by Oksana Zabushko called Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex the most influential Ukrainian book of the years of independence. The main trick admitted by Grabovich is that sex is only in the title. It is, uh, yes, it is ironic to the reader. Without sex, there is no bestseller. <laughs> Thus, Ukrainian fiction has never been vulgar. It has never been a literature of body. It has always been a literature of the soul. High poetry and figurativeness, superstition, lyricism, and the Pesogenesis of loneliness, there are, these are the main traits which form a Ukrainian paragraph. A Ukrainian female characters love secretly. The main message is that true love should be hidden from the eyes of the public. The fiction of every previous age had always been bound to the canon. Classicism, romantic romanticism, uh, realism, and their variations dictated the shape of artistic work. The authors who challenged to, uh, the accepted forms became innovators the, and automatically wrote their names in the pages of history. Uh, the first generation of unprecedented freedom gave birth to a galaxy of writers whose constant literary uh, experiments erased John, bodies, uh, John Bod uh, Borders so bravely. We no longer speak about drama, novel, or poem. We've got a tomb text instead. The gens of modern Ukrainian works are identified twice, by the authors themselves and by literary criticism. If the most widespread hybrids in the literature in general are double texts, which actually combine two equal genres, a novel essay, a novel in letters, an epistolary novel, a memoir novel, a novel reportage, a novel a testament, a romance diary, a novel confession. The modif modifications of Ukrainian authors are semantically remote from the traditional forms. We have an alleged novel by Irvanets, instead of a novel by Androhovich, a small novel by Taraksyuk, a novel meditation by Stefanik, a stream of consciousness by Pashkovsky, a novel symphony by Matthias, a novel game by Riznik, a novel mosaic by Diduch, a novel palindrome by Sh uh, uh, Sharvarka, a novel sonata by Bagriani, and many others. The Craving to express oneself in unconventional ways was inherent to Ukrainian nature, even in the times of rigid forms. In 1911, Lesya Ukrainka created a forest song, which is actually a drama extravaganza, a drama poem, a drama myth, a drama fairy tale. Her first step of freedom was to write in Ukrainian, which almost no one had done before. Her second step was to break the mold of styles. Another icon was Lina Kastenka, who still craved. Her physical face has, uh, uh, was unknown to the public until 2010. Then she came out with her first work of prose, Notes of a Ukrainian mad Madman. Her experiment within the frame of New John, the novel of combination of fiction, eternal diaries, chronicles, contemporary journalism was considered a failure. Still, it was a prophecy for current events. The inimitable images of her poetry has given shape to my thoughts about today's reality. 
The Ukrainian literature of today is still an untold story, a terra incognita, with its own laws and images. Sometimes it forgets itself in playing with suddenly obtained freedom. Sometimes it form its formulas are too complicated. Often, Ukrainian artists, like Les Poddorevansky, manipulate classical images. The masks for his genius are plays on Shakespearean plots, countless texts of world literature, chronotopes, historical illusions, and philosophy. His messages, wrapped in slang, are caustic. His voice is so loud that it had to be turned into humor as not, so as not to deafen. True Ukrainian thought still needs to be heard, not by the ears, but by the hearts and souls of those who haven't lost their ability to perceive my planet. Are you listening? This is called Autobiography of a Semicolon. The autobiography in poetry, as I write it, demands an ultimate ease and elan. But wherever I attempt a page or two in my pre dawn writing hour, I feel I am on a morning walk with my unruly dog on a leash. My writing quickly alternates between left and right, between prose and poetry, dialogues and confessions, diaries and documents, taking all genres into one unified whole. Or I would say, more precisely, one unified chaos, which I sumptuously enjoy. Achilles, a forgetful poet friend, who confuses his own home address for someone else's, talks to someone else's wife as his own, and tells his real wife that in his eyes all women look alike. <laughs> Having read book one of my autobiography, tells me, like a spokesman for Bernard Shaw, that all biographies are lies. The first poem I wrote 38 years ago was not a lie. The last poem I wrote a week ago here is not a lie either. I never wrote a single poem which did not pop up from a coffin of truths. I have written, I have written many bad poems, but I have never lied to my readers. But I know for sure that lies are necessary for art a delicious sauce on a vile dish. No poem, no fiction, no autobiography, no plague is great without lies. We need aesthetics to clothe our poems. We must at least be scantily dressed to walk down the street. The clothing is the gatekeeper of aesthetics. As I look back at the sequences of my 35 years, as an author of 29 books of poems, I feel I have been a little semicolon all these years. Just a small piece of language. Like a bartender, I attended a fixed table of geniuses. I was asked to pour wine into the glasses of Pablo Neruda, Mayakovsky, Miroslav Halu, Jivanandadar, the great Bengali poet, Apollinaire, Allen Ginsberg, Nikanur Para, Nazim Hikmat, Amiri Baraka, Suntara Tanikawa, and Ted Hughes. Even a, 11 in all, a perfect magic number. One evening, one of them, I cannot remember which, told me to go and collect my own language. <laughs> hey, young man, he said, go, run, and collect one semicolon from the world. Since then, I have been walking with a huge semicolon on my back for the last 35 years, like carrying a cross. I'm sure my autobiography is going to be the 
autobiography of a semicolon, who grew bigger and bigger in order to witness my hunger in childhood, which was a holocaust in my stomach, the noxious-like movement in my tender age, communist violence in the name of upholding justice for the poorest of the poor, and a lot of blood on the staircase leading us to eternity. There was recently a midnight knock on my door. In this age of Android phones, we do not expect surprise visitors. Annoyed, I opened the door, only to find a pretty young woman about my son's age in jeans and a jacket, holding a bottle of wine in one hand and a Voltaire paperback in another. She whispered to me, may I come in? I just landed from the sky. I want to leave with your semicolon. She took a seat and told me, even not my daddy. I have a daddy somewhere hidden in a desert. You have never seen me before because I am your nemesis. This is how book two of my autobiography begins, with a visit from the muse in couplets, re-examining my truths in different places, my bedroom, kitchen, and bathroom. In a lush green landscape, I am one poet, but in a time of Holocaust, I'm the other. But the million dollar question is, people seem to believe that poetry is good in the bedroom, but would it be also be romantic in bathroom, they ask. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, the IKEA catalog of literature. I am a Met Metreushka, Metreushka, yes, Tatiana, Metreushka, doll of minorities. I am an Israeli Jewish Sephardic female writer. I am also called Datlash, a nickname for formerly religious people in Israel. And according to my grandmother, I'm the only Moroccan loser woman who refused to clean and cook fish to eat. So, as the only person in this particular minority group, no human rights activists care about me, not even one. But in fact, instead of complaining, I can use my metreushka and join the great catalog of literature that exists in Israel and in fact in any place. This catalog is a special place for you. You only need to choose from fantasy, science fiction, horror, political writing, and folklore. Sometimes the catalog asks you to be more specific and to define yourself according to your gender, race, origin, etc. Beyond the fact that it's boring to belong to a catalog, this catalog is a danger to society because instead of containing everybody without a label, it will give them a limited place, rather than freedom. The catalog never includes marginalized individuals. The poet Wislava uh, Szymborska said that her mistake was that instead of loving people, she loved humanity in general. The important thing is to recognize in the, sorry, the important thing is to re recognize individuals. If we move outside of literature for a moment, in Israel I can see a phenomenon of many people being diagnosed as hyperactive, dyslexic, and so on, which was not the case 25 years ago. The, the diagnosing factory flourishes. The people I have observed pay to be diagnosed with something, but the people who really need this help are not in the game, and this seems unfair. How can those who need real assistance be referred differently? Back to literature. Take, for example, the awful definition, women's literature. Now, at first glance, <laughs> it looks very liberal and modern, but think about it. Is there any man's literature? Did anyone ever hear about a man who writes from his loins? from his muscles. <laughs> of course, as a woman, I am not claiming that the situation of women is perfect or that there was never any discrimination. But I want to decide how and about what to write. In Juvenalia by Jane Austen, who wrote during a period in which women were only allowed to faint in every corner and ask for smelling salts, you meet a gallery of female characters who are excellent, funny, and tragic, and none of them reflect the feminine womb. 
Alas, not all the characters take part in a Supreme Council of Right for Women. Austin, as a great writer, wrote first of all as a writer. She favored art over an agenda, hard work over propaganda, and subtext over text. If we think about it further, we see that good books have no definition. What is the definition of Dickens' books? Did he write only from the perspective of a social critic seeking ju justice? He, who, by the way, left his wife and children for a younger woman? Or maybe Miguel de Cervantes, would his uh, work be called fantasy, poetry, grotesque? What is the importance of labeling literature at all except to give a job to someone in academia? <laughs> <laughs> I hope that uh, nobody from the academia is there. <laughs> I will escape uh, on time. As we can see, good literature does not require categorization. And this reminds me that my friend, a very religious person who reads the Brother Karamazov by Dostoevsky, told me this chapter, she means the rebellion, a 16th chapter, proves that there is a God and that he is very religious. Very interesting, I responded, because I came to exactly the opposite conclusion. <laughs> I admit that sometimes when life becomes hard, I ponder the idea of joining activist writers. Everything would be easier. I would only need to say politics and protest, and the audience would forgive me for all my cliches language and the overdose of folklore I use. <laughs> Unfortunately, I believe that nobody in the audience will care this at all. In, this, in, this, in days like this, claims come to me not only from the catalog, but for, for my family itself. Are you crazy? You created a character who is an alcoholic Moroccan grandmother? It's known that Moroccans are very kind and hospitable. Why does a grandmother plant cactus to ward off guests? How could the woman in your novel be forbidden to marry? What is the duty of women if not to marry? Why don't you describe our good food instead? <laughs> Well, I truly think that there are already enough cookbooks on the shelf. And in regard to folklore, I can only remember that Nabokov wrote about Gogol. When I want a good nightmare, I imagine Gogol penning in little Russian dialect volume after volume of Dikanka and Mirgorod stuff about ghost hunting the bank of the Deniper, Burlska Jews, and dashing Cossacks. <laughs> Okay, to the question. What's the shape of your paragraph? Whose paragraph are we talking about? Who are you? I need paragraphs. Without paragraphs, I wouldn't be able to write any prose. I need framing the empty space that frames the text. I need pauses and stops because a temporal and linear continuity is extremely difficult for me. My paragraphs are quite short. They have the shape of a musical phrase so that one musical thought continues through the paragraph. Of course, there can be cessors in the middle of the paragraph too. Some of my para paragraphs need to grow longer so that the text can run more freely. I tend to have an ending, ending in each paragraph as if I were writing a serial poem. The ending is sometimes a closure. It turns the whole content of the paragraph upside down. More often, it is an open ending that expands the content of the paragraph. I can also, I, it can also be something that just occurs and carries you to a different place. Do we think that there are two types of writers, the poet and the prose writer? The poet would be interested in the present moment in that the present subordinates all the other tenses. The past and the future exist for her only in so far as they exist in the present. She needs pauses. She needs to have a new look. She starts from an empty table. And the prose writer, when he begins his daily writing, he writes to continue. He is able to cope with time. What is he interested in? Is he drawn to the past? Does he want to explain how the things became what they are? I mean, not things. The poet may, may also be interested in things. 
she may be interested in stones and wind and trees, especially trees. Mm. The prose writer is more, more interested in human beings. Does he want to understand how somebody became what she, he or she is? Is he interested in the future? Is he interested in what may happen if things go this or that way? Or is he not at all interested in reality because he is a fiction writer? <laughs> Does he want to create a better world? I don't understand the prose writer. <laughs> My prose writing wangles its way in. I need to use tricks. I cannot think of a novel as a temporal unity. I think of it as a spatial unit. It's a container, a set of scales that has to be kept in balance. But isn't all literature artificial? The sense of continuation always more or less constructed. Is the question of genre specialization a rather political and educational one? Is it, is it interesting to talk about literature institutions? Is the whole question a first world mm -hmm. problem? In my country, a large amount of artistically vivid literature takes place in, in the shadow areas between genres. Why do I use these vital metaphors when I'm speaking about the quality of a text? Is it because in my country, literature has become a middle-class hobby written by middle-class writers for a middle-class audience? Uh, the need to avoid repetition raises moral feelings in me. But at the same time, are we soon in a situation in which repetition is the least of our problems? Is the whole European culture in crisis? Is there a connection between the trend of sincerity in poetry and, the, and this feeling of crisis? In Finland, we don't have the trinity of poetry, fiction and non-fiction, only poetry and prose. The need for distance from the Swedish-speaking cultural and economic elite has made Finnish culture somewhat anti-intellectual. The Finnish writer used to be, according to the stereotype, mm. a man from the woods, an autodidact mm. genius who did not need any education. He would write realistic fiction about everyday life surrounded by trees. <laughs> for a long time, our fiction mainly looked like this. Poetry was more <coughs> difficult but it also had trees. <laughs> Creative writing education is still poorly developed in Finland. We do have high level, level education in other art forms. It is only the, right, the writers who have to collect their knowledge here and there. This means that writers are, are some sense more amateur than other artists. The amateur in me thinks that writing is something deeply human and, uh, and available to everyone. As a writer, I want to open, open up instead of closing and speciali specializing. I think that regardless of the artic artistic or commercial value of a text, the act of writing is in itself has a value without measure. Selamat pagi. Uh, finding a voice through the genre. In the mid 80s, I started to write literature. Since I didn't have any teacher, my point of reference was the work of writer I considered good at the time. I copied their style and idea when, when I wrote either fiction or poetry. So, one week, I might write a Kafka short story, and the week after that, produce millions of beauty pamphlets and then try to be sarcastic yet entertaining social commentator in my essays. Every single piece was brilliant, or so I thought. Uh, because, you know, <laughs> anytime I read it now, uh, that writing now, I feel the urge to take off my shoes and use them to catch my tears of shame. <laughs> well, well, you know the feeling, right? When you're young, you fell in love with your own writing, you think you're next in line for some major prestigious award, and a few years later, you're like, what did I write? <laughs> okay. 
Even though, even though back in those days I felt that I already achieved something, some of my stories and poems were published in Renown, Renown magazine and newspaper in Indonesia, I began to acknowledge uh, one cold fact. I did not have my own voice as a writer. Finding my voice was a struggle for years. I gave up writing poems because I felt peace, my piece were more and more artificial. And maybe there is, I don't love three that much. <laughs> so, but for fiction, I was stubborn enough. After studying geodetic engineering for six miserable years and after making a sign from it, I started working as journalist at Tempo, Indonesia uh, news magazine. And this became a turning point in my writing. I cover politics, culture, sport, science, business, and everything else. Yeah. But I did not do straight news reporting. Tempo's narrative style demands that the journalist tell story based on fact. As it turned out, I really enjoy writing nonfiction. Sometimes a story presented itself that was stranger than fiction, but more often than not, I had to dig deeper. However, finding material for my pieces trained me to use all five senses when reporting, to search for most suitable people to use as sources, and to con conduct adequate research. Since then, I apply the same pattern when I write fiction. Looking for good material is a must. My short story, Adelweiss, pay her condolence in Chiputat, began with the premise that what if someone you hate come to tragic end? How would you respond? I had to get solid material. So the premise worked out and not a story about people who cheer on plight of other. The limited space afford to magazine article trained me to write as efficiently as possible with no wasted word. This is very useful primarily for writing short story because the space in newspaper or magazine is also limited, 2,700 words maximum. Meanwhile, writing lengthy fiction gave me an understanding of how to maintain stamina and play with tempo, two things that become very handy when I wrote my novel. In the late 90s, I also started translating novel and nonfiction from English and French into Indonesian. My first published translation was Einstein Dream, a novel by Alan Lightman, and the novel will, was received. Uh, okay. I love translating because it teaches me to choose words and idioms carefully. When translating, I often imagine how the authors speak in Indonesian. It's not because I am afraid something will be lost in translation, but because I want to do the justice to the original. It is common for Indonesian to venture into many genres of writing. Most of founders of Tempo Magazine are fiction writer and poet. Not, of, not all of them excel in every genre, but some do. But I strongly believe that writing in many genres will make you better equipped. Saying that it is an unnecessary burden for serious writer to specialize in super, single super genre is an understatement. Writers already have enough pressure and guilt because anytime we publish our work in form of a book, we know that thousands of trees have to be cut down. <laughs> so I have, I have some three too, finally. <laughs> so it's only fair that we are judged or labeled by the quality of our work, not by our gender of choice. So if we call actor versatile, musician inventive, and as artist explorative when they venture into many genres, why do we need to give a discouraging label to a writer? Do we not suffer enough? <laughs> wonderful collection of presentations and just a, a reminder that the presentations always end up on uh, our website a few hours after the conclusion of the of the panel so you have a chance to study these in more detail and I think we're waiting on some questions and while we're waiting you know I want to I want to ask a question of Tatiana you said toward the very end of your piece talking about the uh, novel notes of a Ukrainian madman yeah. You said, still, it was a prophecy for current events. H how did that, how was it a prophecy? In what ways? OK, actually, <clears throat> Lina Kostenko is a person who writes uh, poetry only. Mm -hmm. And her poetry is so great that there is no translator who can translate it. It's not translated because it is intranslatable. Uh, and uh, she wrote, and uh, then nobody saw her face. And then she appears with this, like, a novel. Uh, prosaic, and everybody said that it is a failure, it's just a journalism, it's nothing else. But actually, in 
three, oh, in three years, yes, we had this war, and everything, everything we have now was predicted in the novel. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. This is something Natasha and I have often talked about, is the way in which uh, so many times in the class we teach international literature today, it seems to us that the writers, the visiting writers are, are a, a couple of years ahead of the curve, right? Mm -hmm. That they have accurately uh, diagnosed something that may come to fruition, and that seems to be the case here. Yeah, so it's, now we have like a second circle of discussion of this novel, because first we took it, forgot it, and then, uh, and then we uh, like pick it again and understand that everything <coughs> was already written. Yeah, so those trees cut down were, <laughs> yeah. it was a good, Thing. Okay. Uh, if a text is labeled literary, I avoid it as being as uh, as boring. <laughs> is thus is thus labeling designated to divide? Is this labeling designated to divide writers readers into class and intellect or both? What do you think about that? If, are, are you trying to write? I guess we could say, are you trying to write literary text? which is to say to bore our questioner, or, or what? What is the question? What, what is the question again? <laughs> I only heard about the trees cut down. The, the, the question says, if a text is labeled literary, uh -huh. the questioner avoids it, thinking that it will be boring. Oh. And so the questioner wonders, is, the, is this labeling Labeling a uh, text literary is that designed to divide readers ah. be between uh, uh, by class and intellect or both? I don't know. To whom was this question? Yeah. <laughs> to everybody? Anybody can answer it, yeah. Or all. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. you do it. I just, uh, do we have the same label in, in our countries even? I don't know if, if you, you use this label in Finnish culture at all. But if, if you ask me if I want to write like literary, I think I do, but I still want to kind of like grasp the reader also. You can do it both, I think. You, so you can be literary and uh, popular at the yeah. same time. I, not, I don't know if it's popular, but it's like um, it doesn't touching have to be, somebody. It doesn't it, have to be boring. Mm. It doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see? Another discouraging label, the literature uh, equal boring. Uh, if I got the uh, question correctly, uh, but I don't know. This, uh, when the first time people label this is literature, this is not literature. Uh, I think I'll, I like to label like uh, good writing and bad writing. That's all. Well, <clears throat> I think I go by labels because, you know, uh, uh, when I go to uh, Bread Garden, if I don't find labels, I'm really absolutely confused because I'm new here. So we all go by labels, whether we accept or not. A poem is a poem is a poem. A novel is a novel is a novel. You cannot say that they, uh, uh, an essay is a novel. So the question is that you can have some essays or a portion, some pages of essays in fiction and also in poetry, you can mix them up, you can mingle them, but you have to say when you are writing poem, you have to say, you have to go by the category that this is a poem, that this is a novel, and this is a non-fiction prose, something like that. Or if you have something other or any other genre in your mind, you can go for it. But I believe in leveling. It's absolutely necessary. It's not boring. I want to, I don't agree. <laughs> I, th I, I think that even if you want to create a documentary, a movie, for example, you need to, to think uh, in literature maybe way, yes? I don't think that even when I write my e essay, essay? Essay. Yes, so I don't think about it as an essay or article, or now I want to uh, write for someone uh, so I, I don't. I think that there is a two uh, kinds of readers. If you talk about the Phoenician, this is a bad reader that I don't want him in my literature, <laughs> and this is the kind. So the, the good, the good reader doesn't ask himself what is about, what is the autobiography of the writer, what what is the background of of the of the writing, and I think this kind of uh, reader can be belong to the 
label things. And the good reader is just see good literature and just see it as a good literature. It's like what, I, do, I don't remember who told it's about porno. I don't know how to explain what is porno, but when I see it, I know what is it. So it's exactly, I can take it for literature, good literature, so. Uh, shall I respond to your... The no, or someone the, else. The semicolon will respond. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's again, you know, uh, if, if you... If you, if you have a bad reader, for example, you, you categorize that he is bad, he is good. Number one, I don't think that you have any right to do injustice to your readers. You don't know who is good, who is bad, because you do not see your readers. They are almost invisible. And you cannot judge them by the cells that you make. And uh, that if uh, the readers do not appreciate your work, you think most of you are so great a writer that in the great works were not sold at all, we know from history. So the question is that it's so difficult to categorize bad readers and good readers. How do you check? Even I have read so many bad books in my life. Everyone has to read bad books in his life or in her life. How could you arrive at a good book? Only through bad books. So I believe that <laughs> Good book, bad book, this category, and good reader, bad reader, good writer, bad writer, these are all very childish, uh, you know, categorizations. I believe, okay, fine, it, there, was, there was a wave of art films in India. What does it mean, art films? It's all over the world, it was either new web films or art films. So it's art books, art poems, art novels. What does it mean? I think, finally, I believe that Good literature, a good poem is a good poem is a good poem. A bad novel is a bad novel. But you have to consider sympathetically that we, in the modern times, we are losing readers everywhere, even in America, Europe. Everywhere we are losing readers. Please welcome a bad reader. At least we have some bad readers. <laughs> and try, 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 try your best to turn them into good readers over the years. Thank you. Uh, what is actually a bad reader and a good reader? What is actually a bad uh, writing or good writing? Different people like different flowers. I hate roses, but it doesn't mean that rose is bad flower. I prefer cactuses, but I like them today. Maybe tomorrow I will like roses. Who knows? We are different in all our times, in, the, our, in different times of our life. I like the botanical theme of this panel. <laughs> <laughs> it began with tree Scott. <laughs> Anybody else want to address this? Or do we have other questions from the audience? Um, the post-colonial literature of India, that is uh, English literature. I mean, Indian English literature. It's not English English literature. But the post-colonial literature is selling well everywhere, in India, in Europe, in America, everywhere. You find so many copies of, you know, uh, the last book of Salman Rushdie, even you find here in, in, in all these libraries in Iowa. So they are selling so well, even I, I just give you one example, you know, the last year, there was a book on elephant in English. If it is written in English, and we have hundreds of books on elephant in Bengali, in Kannada, in, uh, in, in as many as 24 languages as approved of by the Constitution of India. So we have more than 24 languages. The point is that if you write in English from India, then there is a red carpet welcome for you. But if you write 29 books in Bangla, like me, so you are nowhere. So this is the difficult situation that the Britishers created for us. And I don't think I rather condemn that if there is any category called British Indian literature, I just hate it. Because, not because of the fact that it is selling well, it is because of the post-colonial identity, but more because of the fact it is still a neo-colonialism which is still continuing in some parts of the pre-colonial states. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. I, I did understand everything what you said, mm. but uh, Last question I understood. I think it's minimize the place. Okay, it's very comfortable to, to someone to give you place 
and to, to tell you, now we want to hear your voice as a woman, but in the way that we want to hear. And you know, after I published my first novel in Israel, um, the very, very big uh, um, newspaper, Idiot Achronot, uh, wanted to, to take interview with me, and um, they uh, made a condition that I came from a little town, Sderot, so um, they want me, a uh, town of immigrants from Morocco, so the newspaper, the journalist asked uh, that it's only if I will talk about the misery mm. of my town and that I became a writer because, the, because uh, despite Sderot and not because. So I told to my PR, but I, I, I like Sderot and I think that I am a writer because, because my grandmother and Sderot and my history. So I told, the, I told her I don't want to, to talk about it, how I, I, how I am so poor, and how the immigration was so poor, and how the grandmother suffered, because this is not what I wrote. And then they canceled the interview. They canceled, they, did it, they, did it, they want yellow things, they want uh, something, they want blood, and they, I didn't give them, because I want they would judge my art and my literature. And of course I'm woman, but I have more labels, okay, if we talk about labels. So I'm woman, I'm mother, I'm, I have many, many titles, but if I'm writing, so I write as a writer. And I want to write uh, about subject as I want to do it. Hmm. So this is, this is uh, the answer. And I think that if you want to courage uh, women or discrim discriminated uh, population to do it, so we can do it with to, to read many, many good books and to, to, to take, to give in the road, for example, workshop, good workshop to, to work with women, with girls like this, but not just to talk about one topic. It's really, really boring. This is a really danger. It's boring. Yes. So I don't know if I an answer, but this is what I felt about it. Galid, I have to tell you that we had a writer in this program many years ago from Cambodia, originally from Cambodia. Her parents were, but she was from Australia, and she wrote a very well-received memoir. And she went to give a reading, I think, in Melbourne. And in the front row was an old woman with a box of Kleenex. Hmm. And uh, this is Alice Pung. And she went up to the woman and said, why do you have the Kleenex? And she said, well, I'm ready, I'm prepared to cry during your <laughs> reading. <laughs> but her memoir was hysterically funny. Yes, okay. yes. yes. I, I, I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah. You want to react? I just want to say that avoid the media, and then you don't know if this or newspaper, I don't use to read critics. I'm sorry if there is a critics in the audience. I don't read critics. I don't read newspaper of literature and mm. news, but that doesn't matter. And I don't, no, so I, I don't know what the definition of this book. And it really doesn't matter if uh, some critics uh, 100 years ago uh, think that uh, Moby Dick, it's a very, very boring book. Mm. It's, I, okay. I don't care. Yeah. We have so stuff. Yes, I, I tried. <coughs> I just tried. But talk, you know, why, why I need to talk about yeah, it? You must be and then to Shinaz, and, 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 and I'll have to repeat the question so, so that we can be here. So. so the question is, yeah. to distill it down to its essence, is that how did each writer become the writer that they are, following whatever styles of writing that they, that they follow? Yeah. Or form, yeah. <coughs> Uh, I think maybe the the for, uh, I choose the form. Uh, I think it's best to convey my ideas or my. I think I can express it, uh, exp express my idea best at that form. I guess. Uh, I don't think I'm good in poetry, uh, in poem or poetry, because you know. I cannot really communicate my ideas through poetry, so I choose uh, uh, fiction or short story or uh, short story or novel. I don't, I can, I don't believe I cannot do it in poem. So yeah, then and I, I feel more comfortable, and not because uh, I believe that prose have more audience than poem, not not something like that, uh, but it's more like you know 
I think it's the best uh, vehicle to convey ideas. Um, I think I almost like answered this. I'll try to like touch the question in my uh, my presentation. But um, I, I think for me it's really important to kind of be conscious of different genres and and like uh, forms and because uh, in my writing is kind of like I have to identify what I'm doing and it's it comes from that I write something and then I look at what I'm writing and and it was like poetry what I was writing in the first first uh, when I started like really seriously to write but then it of, of course it changes but I somehow wanted to comment a little bit of, of this uh, last debate about labels and, and because they kind of like now we are talking about labels and genres and um, at the same conversation we don't really do make the difference and I uh, kind of like I don't think you can't really think about anything without labels or you can't really um, and, and the labeling in itself, when, when it comes to like a woman writer, it's like something that you do with, like it's a marketing or it's maybe a, an authority who gives you that label. But at the same time, you can kind of like also cope with the labels or not to not like think that it's not that important. You can make it a, like a theme in your writing if you want. Or I, I, I also don't agree that, I, that it's, it's not true that uh, men writers have, haven't been labeled. I, I wrote uh, an essay about boy poetry in Finland. <laughs> so, <laughs> but because there was this huge girl poetry um, like trend. But yeah, I, I answered everything. Now I stop. <laughs> There is a game that I very like to do with my audience in lecture in Israel. I used to bring uh, David Grossman uh, part of his books, and I don't say that this David Grossman, and then Iris Marduk. And yes, David Grossman, everyone here knows, I think. David Grossman from Israel. So it's amazing. 90% from the audience thinks that David Grossman is a uh, woman and Iris Marduk is a man. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I just uh, I, I don't. I'm not sure that I I understood the question. How we write? Mm. How we write her now? I mean, Stefan, I don't understand. You're, you're challenging John, but nonetheless, you've chosen a certain genre and style predominantly. You might write in more than one, but something predominant. What you're not when, when I write. Before I writing, so I, I never, uh, I, I just, this is a question that very bother me. Mm. So I start to write and I don't think about it if it will be a fantasy book or something like this. I just, yes, maybe I don't, what? It kind of creates to one genre. Like yeah, but they don't create one genre. But, uh, Why, why do you just yes, that? I wrote, but uh, I don't think I don't care if it will be re in the end uh, magi, mag, how do you say, magic realism or something like this. But it's not poetry. But I wrote poetry, poetry also. <laughs> yes. I think we're I think we're having a translation issue here. So. Um, okay. Okay. Quick, to, to take you this. quickly. I ah, do. But we have time, so make it quick, and uh, I want to get one last uh, just question to, in. Yeah. Just one. Don't, don't yeah. agree with me. Yeah. Can you respond to Stephanus? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know whether it is um, an answer to your question or a question to your question. It's just a, one example I can cite from Indian Bengali literature, contemporary Indian Bengali literature, when we are talking about levels. Uh, it's very sad and funny at the same time. Uh, a writer called Shomnath, who was a male writer, after surgical operation, he is now female. And he's a female. He is a female writer or she is a female writer. I don't know. But her identity has been cracked or rather elevated. I don't know. But now most of the people like us, Consider there are two writers in him or her. So one who was writing before he became um, female, and so it's male to female, and both male and female writings. So 
how is it is it gender or how it is uh, uh, leveled i don't know his first writings his early years writing and contemporary writing so they they are again uh, leveled even by the same writer or of the same writer so this is uh, again a very difficult situation for me to how to level it a terrible difference. That, that's, that's the question, you know. So uh, he or she has totally been um, another writer now the right, than the one that he was before or she was before. That's a very complicated situation. Uh, I have never uh, tried to choose any form. Uh, I, uh, just people chose the, it for me because when I wrote my poems and presented to the poets, uh, to this union of poets in Kharkiv, they said, your poems are rubbish, try yourself in prose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I, and I tried myself in prose, but I sent it not to the poets of Kharkiv, I sent it directly to Kiev, to, this, uh, to people from uh, Ukraine and from Germany, and it became successful, not because it's uh, like better than my poems, but, but because I send it to the people, to the right people. Um, <laughs> I think, yes. Give me the list after that. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, I don't choose any shape. Uh, all my poems are very different, and they are written in a different style. And even if you take my novel, it is written in a different style, and uh, it is topically different, and uh, the form is different in different places, yes? So uh, the thought uh, takes its shapes, uh, well, in the very uh, middle of writing. So no, uh, like, target shapes before. And Shanaz, I want to ask, have you ask your question, but we're going to have to hold it because our time is up here, and uh, we have gone on. The trees have been proliferating, and uh, so I thank you all very much, and we'll look forward to next time.